Thank you for joining us on the Winning at Selling podcast. I'm Bill Hellcamp of Reach Development Systems, and with me is Professor Scott Plum of the Minnesota Sales Institute. Peter Drucker once said, culture eats strategy for lunch. Common topics of blogs and podcasts are often focused on retention, recruiting, and defining an overall culture. I heard a quote one day, culture is defined by what leadership is willing to tolerate. Are you ready to create some options on transforming your culture? Or do you want to settle for the same old status quo? Don't change the channel as Bill and I welcome John Christensen, filmmaker and founder of The Fish Philosophy on episode 563 of the Winning and Selling podcast. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing from John. I've seen his uh, his film years ago and just saw it again recently yeah. as a reminder. So looking forward to it. Now, we'd normally do our book club at this time, but whenever we have guests, we skip the book club. So we give them the, the full half hour. Our next week are, is a new book, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. It's not a new book. Yeah, it's one of the forward. original uh, self-development books out there. So mm -hmm. uh, looking forward to starting that. But that will be next week. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to introduce John Christensen. This is the fish film. Many of you may have seen the fish film. This is based on the Pike's Place Fish Market in Seattle. And John is an award-winning, world-famous filmmaker and CEO of Chart House Learning, the leading producer of many corporate learning films, including Fish, which is celebrating its 25th year anniversary this year. So it's really survived the test of time. The Fish film has been adopted by thousands of schools, hospitals, government departments, corporations, and businesses worldwide. Welcome, John. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks, Bill and Scott. It's yeah, nice to have you here. on the show. Just to start off in total transparency, John is a client of mine, so you might sense a little bit of bias in my positioning, and that's why. As long as there's no not too much sucking up, Scott, you know, <laughs> we right. keep that to a minimum. I met John when uh, The Fish first came out in 1999. I worked at Chart House Learning and uh, was just really in awe of the film and the philosophy and and I'm I'm really grateful to learn about how it's made an impact over the last 25 years, John. So congratulations on celebrating 25 years. Thank you. It is quite the nice accomplishment. It, it's really about how it's helped people. That's why it's uh, lived so long. So, yeah. And what? tell us a little bit about what inspired you to make this film. I've heard some great stories about how you got here or what, what made you decide the film, if you could share it with our listeners. Certainly. Well, I can take a long story and I'm going to try and make it short today. So uh, I grew up I'm an only kid and my dad was a documentary award-winning documentary filmmaker. And so uh, at one point in time in my life, my dad said, why don't you come work with me? And so I took him up on that opportunity. And as, as a good father and son team, uh, the son always wants to prove himself to the father, but then also as a mentor mentee, I wanted to prove to my master artist that I could make a film. So I got this weird little idea that was in my head. It was in a film called Flashdance, which actually it celebrated its 40th anniversary this, this year. Uh, it's a film about a young woman who wants to be a dancer, a mm -hmm. ballet dancer. And it, there's scenes in that film about her being passionate about her work, but that's not the scene that gravitated that, that, captured my eye and attention there was a scene in there it's a pittsburgh pennsylvania and there's a traffic officer dancing to his job now here's a traffic officer in full garb in winter coats on white gloves and dancing and directing traffic with his full body hands and feet and and just being passionate about his job and that image stuck with me saying if a traffic officer can have this much passion, shouldn't we all have some kind of passion in our work? So I, I had this film idea of doing your work with passion, of being connected to it. And uh, that film came out in 1983. So that that idea percolated with me. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, some 20 years later, I I stumbled upon, I was working on another film in, in, out in the Seattle area. And I came upon this very interesting place that captivated my attention. And lo and behold, it was a fish market. Um, here was a group of gentlemen 
engaged in their work. They were hugging customers. They were throwing fish. There was this laughter. There was this excitement. There was this passion. And, and, uh, I finally got the courage to ask one of them, Sean, the crazy redhead in the film and said, what's going on here? Sean took this stance, looked me right in the eye and said, did you have lunch today? And I said, yes. And he said, well, did the waiter or waitress connect with you? I sort of sat back and took a moment and said, mm, kind of, but not really. He said, he looked me directly in the eyes and said, this moment is yours and mine. How can I serve you? Wait a minute. This is a fishmonger. There's yelling and screaming going around me. And he's holding his hands up beside his head saying, this moment is yours and mine. I, I found my place. Here was the place I was looking for for all these years of saying, mm. these guys are connected to what they're doing. They're passionate. I see them hugging customers, giving customers high fives. And then Sean says, this moment is yours and mine. It was it was an aha moment. I, I found my place where I could make a film about people doing their work with passion. So interestingly, I thought I had a great customer service film. Here's these guys that I've never seen customer service like that. Where where do you see people getting hugs, you know, other than winning a, a, a game, a, a sports mm -hmm. event, right? So there was my, the incubus of saying, I want to make a film about these guys. So that's how it started. Now, the, the film has four practices that are included, the theme of the entire film. Um, could you share the four practices with our listeners so what the fish film is about? Certainly. So here, looking at what the guys were doing on the shop floor and saying, we're kind of like anthropologists. We, we filmed like 36, 37 hours of footage to get down to boil down to, we've got it down to 18 minutes. And so when we analyzed and said, what's going on here, we, we sort of, our team at Chart House looked at it and, and saw a language appearing. We created the language that was being spoken on the floor, but not, not really, they didn't articulate it that way. Our team at Chart House put the articulation to the, to the language. And so we created this language called the fish philosophy. And what I saw on the shop floor was gentlemen choosing their attitude. They, they, they chose how they show up. They chose how they reacted to things. So the first, first practice we call them practices is choose your attitude. The next is be there. They had this incredible ability to be present in the moment with their customers and each other. Then they were very, very playful. They were having this incredible engagement with each other and they were playing with the customers. They'd let the customers come up and, and try and catch the fish. They'd throw fish over customers' heads and the, the scales would, you know, get in their hair. And people were just laughing and having this incredible fun. And then I saw the moments that they were making people's day when they would let them behind the counter and try and catch the fish. Or they have this big mung fish, which is a big fish that has a huge mouth and nasty teeth. And it's sitting on the showroom floor. And when somebody comes by, they pull a string and it moves. And then it scares the people. I mean, <laughs> there, there, there's these moments, these captured moments of, of making people's day that I saw. So again, the practice are choose your attitude, be there, play, and make their day. Now, we call them practices because these are practical applications that you need to apply in your life every day. If you do that, you'll you'll have a wonderful life. John, one of the things I noticed in watching the video is that, uh, as you said, the energy that they put into their work and their day. Uh, you filmed it 25 years ago. Have you gone back? Have they been able to maintain that level of energy? And if so, what keeps it going so well? Because I think that people sometimes when they have an initiative at work, it just gets tiresome to them after a while. They practice being in the moment, this presence and this, this deep connection to their intention that, you know, the intention, here's a great line out of the film. Actually, you're going to do something different if you're being world famous than if you're just being ordinary. Mm. So they come to the table every day 
with the mindset of what are we doing to be world famous? How am I interacting with our guests in a world famous way? So they, that's that's in their brain, that's in their intention every day. That's part of the choosing, choosing how I show up every day. You know, another beautiful line from the film is, who are you being while you're doing what you're doing? Who are you being? How are you showing up to others? And and that really, it's a infectious piece, you know? With the day of COVID, it's infection is the wrong word to say, but it, <laughs> it is. I mean, truly, when I was standing there, the first time I saw him, it was in this infectious energy. I'm going... I want this kind of energy in my work. You know, I, I want to be this engaged and this happy and this excited about what I'm doing in my work. So there is this piece of their energy that is infectious. People gravitate towards it. I mean, people are coming from all over the world to see these guys work. I mean, that's just an incredible piece. Mm -hmm. That is so true, John. Could you describe a scenario where the, the fish philosophy would be valuable? I think when when you first learned about fish and then you came home, there was a situation at a at a clinic. Kind of could you share a little bit more about that scenario and the application as to how fish can be used? Right. So th there's two parts to that story. I'll do it quickly. When I first saw the fish market, there was this engagement that happened, this make their day moment, this be present moment. Sean, again, the crazy redhead that I first introduced myself to at the market. I Before I introduced myself, I saw this little scenario happen. They have a bucket of live crawdads. And Sean took this little crawdad out, one crawdad, and went over to a little boy about five or six years old and had the crawdad, you know, pinchers trying to catch the little boy's jacket. The little boy screamed bloody murder. I mean, he started crying. Sean saw this. Sean put the put the crawdad back in the bucket, literally got down on his hands and knees, eye to eye with the little boy, and said, I'm so sorry I scared you. Can I have a hug? And you could see the little boy's demeanor just change, right? <sighs> he just sighed and gave Sean a hug. Now, that was an, another incredible moment on the shop floor that I saw that, you know, solidified that I have to make a film about this. But now the scenario that Scott's talking about is come back to Minnesota. My oldest daughter, as she's five years old at the time, and, and we were, she had terrible asthma. And so we brought her to find, you know, really good children's clinic here in Minnesota. And, our, our our event of how we got treated was the receptionist didn't even look at us. She's clicking on the computer to type us in, doesn't even look at us, doesn't acknowledge us, says, okay, have a seat. The nurse calls us into the room, literally puts my kid on the scale, whacks her on top of the head with the measuring tape, and plops her on the cold, sterile, you know, bench there for the doctor to look at her. The doctor comes in says, uh, say, ah, uh, listens to her chest and her back and says, let's increase her albuterol. That's the healthcare scenario I just had with my daughter on Monday. Saturday, I'm seeing a little boy scared and a fishmonger down on his hands and knees saying, I'm so sorry I scared you. I saw more empathy and care and love in a shop floor from a fishmonger with a little boy than I did in my healthcare system. Where did the health, where did care go in healthcare is what I thought at that very moment of saying, wait a minute, if fishmongers can give this miscare and love to their clients and people even not buying fish, why can't our average nurse, doctor, or even just customer service person give this much love and care to our, our clients? So. One of the things that, that I've seen, John, is that people feel that to be professional, they somehow need to be buttoned down and boring. And uh, obviously, you know, when you show your film, oh, this is a fish market, they can do that there. But I am a professional salesperson. I have to be X, Y, Z. That's my expectations. How do you help them? How does the film and how do the philosophies help them get beyond that and connect more effectively with their customers, with their patients, with, with other people. 
but good, great question, Bill. The point is, is that if you think about it, if you have create memorable experiences with clients, patients, you know, uh, whoever you're serving, if you have those memorable moments, I mean, you know, experience economy, Joe Pine and those guys talk about that of saying you create memorable experiences. And that's what we're talking about. When you, when you engage with somebody, yes, we're saying this playfulness. Well, think about it. Are you having more memories by somebody being crabby at you or somebody who's making you feel good? And I think that, that feel good, that play, that creativity, that fun piece uh, that reminds me of a story that now this was, you know, 20, 20 years ago, 22 years ago, I'm checking out at target. This was a long time ago when you had to sign the, the credit card slips, mm -hmm. right. And target had the pens on a little beaded chain. Remember that a long time ago, mm -hmm. half the, half yeah. of our audience doesn't remember that. <laughs> Don't yeah. talk about typewriters either. <laughs> <laughs> or dial telephones. Yeah. yeah. So, so the the pen was on a chain and I went to sign my you know credit card piece and here's the pen on the chain and I go to grab the pen and the cashier pulls the chain from underneath the counter and the pen runs away from me <laughs> and she looks at me and <laughs> smiles and puts the pen back in my back up to where I need to sign it and dog on it if I didn't go for the pen again and she pulled it away again <laughs> no. But we net, look at that. Mm -hmm. That was over 20 years ago. And I'm telling the story 20 years later. That's wow. just one little instance of saying a cashier can make a moment happen. Mm -hmm. That was an experience, silly as it may be. But that was a memorable experience. And if you create those memorable moments for your patients, for your clients, for your customers, just think of what can happen. And so, John... Talk about the 25 years for this film has been around. How has the market changed over the 25 years and how is the fish film still relevant? How can it be used in, in, in companies and organizations in today's marketplace? Well, here's the relevancy. I mean, uh, COVID has thrown us a really big curveball by the fact of saying people now are debating why they want to go back to the office. There's this thing called camaraderie. There's this thing called that we're human beings and we need to be with each other. So the language of fish is really about building community and relationships. It's two, two parts. It's about how you are as a human being, how you're showing up as a human being. And then the other part is how you're building your relationships. So this piece of practicing being there for people, are you being in the moment? I mean, I can, I know many stories in my head where I wasn't being there for my associates, right? I'm, I'm typing on the computer when they're in my office and I'm still looking up things on the website when they're talking to me. That's not being present with people. Again, how am I making these moments memorable? How am I being present in the moment? So when we say, is it relevant today? It's more relevant than it has ever been in some respects. Because now, today, with two things, our, our, our attention span has been shortened very much, and this relational piece, we need to go back and build our relationships. Next is, it's a, it's, this is old wisdom. This is ancient wisdom just packaged in a new way. You know, it was, it was working 25 years ago. It's going to work 100 years from now because it's really about us as human beings, how we show up, how we're being present, and how we build relationships. You know, it reminds me of a situation I was in, John. Uh, I, I took my mother somewhere with some people that I knew, and, and she's in her 90s, and I introduced her to somebody, and, and they were gracious to her. And after we left, she said, you know, it was really interesting. As he was introducing himself to me, he was looking past me to see if there was somebody more important to talk to. Wow. And right. we really noticed these things. I, I, I saw that when you, when you opened up with your story about the person putting his eye, his hands on either side of his eyes, so he could focus and say, this is your moment. What can I do to serve you? Mm -hmm. And we don't do that. We, we tend to skip the moment and, and look for the next good thing to come along. 
And we're always trying to get two steps ahead rather than just being right where we need to be at this moment. And I, I think that's a great story. Right. And, and and to reiterate on that, this be present piece, truly listen for what's being said. Because we've got this chatter in our heads of going, oh, they're saying this, and now how am I going to answer that? And I've got to plan my answer well so I look smart and all that, versus just being in the moment and and really listening, truly listening, soulfully mm. listening. That's mm. a that's a another piece that we as human beings we need to work on. I mean that that you're right. I mean, he was looking for the next best thing. He was looking beyond her versus think how much if the attention was just on her, mm -hmm. you know, she would have mm -hmm. remembered that. She remembered right. it because he wasn't present for her. Mm -hmm. So true. I remember when I was in the process of getting my first root canal and I'm calling the place that the dentist referred me to. The first thing they say is, do you have insurance? And I'm like, oh my goodness. I mean, this is, I mean, the anxiety of a root canal when I've never had one before. And they want to talk about whether I have insurance or not. No connection at all. Very, very sterile conversation. I made an appointment and then the next day I canceled it because I thought about it. I'm like, this is not going to get any better. I am not going to feel like I'm a person in this factory of doing root canals. And I know they do a lot of root canals, but I really want that personal relationship. And I think a lot of businesses want to have personal relationships with their customers, especially in your, the, the retail environment, the sales in, environment. And John, you know, the fish film is very, very attractive in schools. Can you share some uh, a story or two about how it has impacted students or created a culture within a school? Yes, absolutely. One of our lovely stories that I, I love telling is the fact that this one sixth grade teacher used fish to build her cohesiveness of her classroom. And that that's, that's one piece of our fish philosophy for schools is that we, we have curriculum for the different age groups in schools and how to build the classroom cohesiveness. Now, when you build a community in your classroom and you get the kids being there for each other, understanding how to make somebody's day, it's real hard to bully somebody. So this teacher, and then it's the fact that the teacher invites the students to help build the classroom community, saying what is acceptable here and what behaviors aren't acceptable here. And then they live up to those standards. The, the kids and the teacher co-created that to build the classroom community of saying, these are the rules that we live by. We live by, we created them, we live by them. So the story that we talk about, she had her best year. These students, we went and interviewed them and they they say, this one girl says it beautifully, we, we have this love for each other. It's not this, it's not emotional love, it's brotherly, sisterly love. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can create that in a classroom for sixth graders, you know, imagine if you can create that in a in a school full school or imagine in a workplace or better yet even in a hospital situation right well the story goes on that these kids i stayed in touch with these sixth graders and in when they were 12th graders i brought two of the kids back two of the boys back and interviewed them with the teacher in the room and they said that class is so cohesive, they still keep connected to each other. Six years later, and some of them went to different high schools, mm -hmm. and they love the fact that they were taught these practices for life. They said, mm -hmm. the boys said they set themselves up for life, that they will take this everywhere with them. When I was interviewing those kids in 12th grade, one of the kids' fathers passed away unexpectedly, and all the kids from the class showed up for the funeral hmm. six years later. Wow. One of our associates that uses fish in schools says this beautifully is that fish in schools helps create socially beautiful children. Something we're certainly striving for these days, isn't it? Yeah. And, and so it's still, that's... it's still relevant within a sales team. And the reason that's the reason I asked the question is the principles of 
wanting to be part of a community or part of a, an organization and setting a standard as to what is acceptable behavior and what is not acceptable behavior. I think, you know, we're all children inside. And I think sales teams are very similar to a classroom environment where we want to create a culture. We want to be able to create expectations and we all contribute to the culture that we want to define. It's not just based on what leadership is willing to tolerate and, and salespeople in their organizations have the responsibility and the obligation to create a culture to support everybody on the team and within the company. So as we start to wrap it up, Bill, any um, final questions or comments or thoughts about meeting with John? Well, yeah, I wanted to bring it to the sales, the, the particular salesperson, because that is our audience, John. As you presented this film over the years, I'm sure you've worked with, with salespeople. What, what do they feel the biggest impact is from this philosophy in working with their clients and in developing uh, a sales persona. Well, let's go, let's analyze what makes a good salesperson, right? Uh, they're mm -hmm. there for their clients. They're making their clients day. And if you do it in a playful manner, I mean, humor, humor in sales is one of the biggest things to help people break the ice. Mm -hmm. And I sure. mean, especially of a salesperson, you can break the ice by being playful or doing something fun and creative that gets you into the door, right? You got to get past the gatekeeper, the receptionist. If you do fun things that, that help you build that rapport and get that way, this is one interesting thing. Uh, <laughs> some big pharmaceutical companies use fish for their sales department because that was the way they could break the ice to get to the doctors mm -hmm. by the fact that they showed the fish film to the doctor's clinic and the doctor's manager was going wow look at what we you know we can create this new environment and the doctor's going wait a minute who who gave us this who told us this who who mm -hmm. invited mm -hmm. this into there and then find out it's the pharmaceutical salesperson right so these practices are what make up a good a good hearted person so if you have these choosing your attitude showing up in a manner that you you're being present you're truly listening to your client you're making their day you're being playful in a way that's memorable i want to go back to let's take a big step backwards but the fish market they're fishmongers what do fishmongers do they sell fish in that little less than 1,200 square feet little group that they have, their shop, the Pike Place Fish Market shop is less than 1,200 square feet. They sell more fish in that little space than most grocery stores in the nation. They sell more fish than anybody else per square foot in the country. Mm -hmm. So does it work for sales? absolutely it works for sales they're they're a living example of how good it is for sales mm -hmm. well john it's been great having you with us today uh we like to give resources or action ability to our to our listeners is there a good way for them to connect with you or learn more about this uh this great fish philosophy yeah please come visit fishphilosophy.com that's our place where we can gather the most information sign up for our blog we'll love to continue talking with you and we have wonderful facilitators that can go in and help bring this into any organization and especially in the sales we can really help a sales team build a cohesive sales team with our philosophy super thanks yeah so true thanks for joining us john and it was just grateful to, to reminisce with you on the entire history of of fish and i can see how it's been part of my behavior in the 25 years that it's been around so um thanks for joining us yeah thanks john. thank you guys i really appreciate the opportunity to share our story thanks all right and scott will uh, link that fishphilosophy.com on our show page yes Let's uh, go into our golden nugget as we wrap up. I think maybe this is what uh, what John did when he started his film making. This is from Ray Bradbury, who is a science fiction author. Living at risk is jumping off the cliff and building your wings on the way down. What do you think well, of that, Scott? Well, so true. I I just I think we'll once we decide to go on a journey, there's a lot of answers that we find along the way if we're open for them. And um, it's a great quote. I can I can see that in my mind how that would come together. Yeah, I've worked with some people that want all the lights to be green before they take off on yeah, the drive. Yeah, exactly. Right? Never, <laughs> never, no. never will be. Ready, aim, 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 aim. You know, keep yeah. aiming. So fire once in a while, get going. Exactly. Exactly. All right. 
So everything we talked about will be at winningatselling.com. This is episode 563. And if you wanted to listen to Joe Pine, he was episode 460 that John referred to, who wrote the book, The Experience Economy. We had him on the show uh, a couple years ago. Next week, our book club is going to start off How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Uh, we're going to read two sections before you get into the chapters, how this book was written and why, and nine suggestions on how to get the most out of this book. So we're going to read the preface so we know a little bit more. And the topic is get the most out of networking. Subscribe, share the podcast with your colleagues on your social media. Go out and get better one skill at a time. Joyful Selling.